Okay, it is one o'clock. I believe we should start. And um, I've been uh, asked to provide a little background about myself and how I came to be where I am today, and uh, particularly how I got into astrobiology. And I guess back in high school, uh, my inspiration to get involved with chemistry uh, got started. Uh, as usual, there's the inspirational teacher, the high school chemistry teacher, who was also quite an outdoorsman. And that had an effect, although I didn't realize it at the time. Uh, also, my older brother decided to get into chemical engineering, so the word chemistry kept popping up here and there. And my father worked for DuPont Corporation, which of course is very well known for their uh, chemical research and their, their plastics and all kinds of other products. Better living through chemistry was their motto back then. It sort of fell out of favor, I think, in subsequent years. But uh, anyway, it was a message that I had received at some level, so I majored in chemistry at Purdue University and uh, got interested in outdoor stuff as uh, a weekend activity, which led to cave exploring, which led to an interest in geology. So I took a geology course and got very interested and uh, was advised to stay in chemistry to get my undergraduate degree, to stay with the core discipline, I was told. Very good advice. But then I went off to Indiana University uh, to pursue a, uh, an advanced degree in geochemistry. And that got me involved with lunar sample analysis, uh, analyzing carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, uh, in the lunar finds and ultimately lunar rocks. Uh, and of course that obviously started the NASA connection. Um, but while I was there, my major professor John Hayes was very much involved in biogeochemistry and, and very much in the issue of searching for life beyond the Earth. He was involved in much of the planning and preparation for the Viking mission. And so that naturally led to me eventually um, applying for a, a position at Ames Research Center to continue studying sort of carbon in the universe, which was another theme they were pushing in those days. And that got me to, uh, you know, basically exobiology, uh, which was pretty much the forerunner for astrobiology. And interestingly, as you probably know, the word astrobiology was raised back in the 60s as a, uh, an interesting name for the program, but some people thought that was too close to astrology to be comfortable, and uh, it's interesting that that concern wasn't raised so much in recent years, in the late 90s, when, uh, when astrobiology finally did take hold as, as a name for the program. So anyway, over, down the, uh, the years, I've been involved in um, carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen geochemistry of lunar samples, got involved in mid-ocean ridge basalt research uh, with the budget of carbon coming up from the mantle along the mid-ocean ridge system, and actually performed the first calculation, accurate calculation of what that flux was, leading to the surprise that we're pumping out 100 to 200 times more carbon CO2 into the atmosphere than all the world's volcanoes. Uh, so that was an insight. And then um, because of the interest in biology that first started at, uh, at, at, at Indiana, uh, I got involved in a microbial mat research program down in uh, Garo Negro in Baja California Sur. And so I've been sort of around here, the, the bio and the geo parts. And then, of course, when the Mars program finally got a jump start in the 90s, I got involved in program planning for missions that would follow up on the Pathfinder mission, and that led ultimately to my involvement in the Mars Exploration Rovers, principally with the Spirit Rover, and now more recently with uh, Curiosity. Along the way, I've also was involved in the CRISM instrument team with Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Um, so the, the latter part of my career, once these missions got going, really got me the, uh, into the space exploration business. And, that's sort of where I am today. Along the way, also, I was very much involved in the roadmap, astrobiology roadmap, when it was first envisioned in 1997, and then I chaired the revision of it in 2003 and 2008. And of course, as you know, it's uh, now being up again for revision. It's been 10 years already since we did our major revision in 2003. So I'm involved also in Mars program planning, uh, trying to make sure that the astrobiology flavor is in there in reality and not just in name. And that's been actually a, a, a quite rewarding effort, as you know. We're, we're really focusing on search for evidence of life now and habitable environments on Mars. So that's the um, overview. And, and I think the uh, key point is to, to make, main, maintain a real core discipline, uh, something like in, in chemistry, physics, or biology that uh, really gives you that, uh, those qualifications for research, but then also in astrobiology, of course, to get into the interdisciplinary aspects because that's as you know where the big interesting questions are not just with searching for life beyond the earth but in environmental uh, questions and a lot of other things that face our society today so we think 
that this is a great program, not just because space exploration is great, but because it really prepares people for the type of interdisciplinary perspective and capability that will help us address our big problems in the future in society. So I'm pretty upbeat about astrobiology, obviously, and uh, that's a little bit of how I came to, uh, to where I am today. So. Uh, so with that, I guess I'm open for questions. I see one here, for, and uh, should identify the person, I guess, Kara Tucker, asking this question. How do you find wavelength ranges for detecting biosignatures on extrasolar planets? Oh my, okay. Um, <clears throat> well, really, let me first issue the disclaimer. I'm not a, a spectroscopist, um, but what I can tell you is that these wavelength ranges that people focus on are pretty much defined by the kinds of hardware that, that are um, that are need to be optimized for that particular range. And so, you know, uh, visible near infrared tends to be in one domain, and of course, is associated with that. You have the uh, you know the types of molecular transitions that, and the vibration states, I guess, really that uh, that are would pre create features in that range. And so that's that's one bin. And then when you get into the mid uh, to uh, infrared, uh, you're really talking about a different type of sensors, um, and of course you're now looking at more fundamental molecular vibrations, which tell you, for example, a lot more about cations, or anions, I should say, what the anions are associated with the uh, mole molecules that you're seeing out there. Um, and so, and then of course, you know, there's people who even, you know, are interested in doing microwave surveys, the whole study uh, search for evidence of intelligent life. Uh, so it's pretty much uh, the wavelength ranges are dictated by the particular instrumentation and therefore the observing uh, telescope that, that uh, one would need to deploy. Uh, but uh, again, each of these ranges is very complementary uh, to the other and we always would argue that if you can have two complementary wavelength ranges sort of both focused at looking at atmosphere composition or surface composition or biosignatures, that that really helps to constrain interpretations the best. So uh, to first order then, the answer is it's oriented based on the type of um, instrumentation required and then secondly on the types of molecular features that you're uh, associated with those and, um, and then the science flows from that. Okay, Shauna Kendall, what instrument package would you like to see on a rover searching for life on Mars? Uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, we, the basic approach to searching for evidence of life on Mars is first to locate the haystack before you search for the needle. In this case, the haystack is the habitable environment. And given that the surface of Mars is equal to the area of all the continents on the Earth, that's a lot of real estate, and a lot of that real estate we think is not particularly promising to search for life, and that's simply because it's volcanic lava flows, features that are pretty much dominated by surface processes on Mars, uh, that have uh, pretty much dominated over the last two, three billion years. And as you know, a very, very dry place, not so much a problem with the cold as it is with the, the very profound dryness. So one area of interest today might be at the margins of the polar caps, but pretty much, um, you know, we're talking about looking for, uh, our focus in the program really now is looking for past life, and that would be life probably in the deep past. <clears throat> and so for this, we need instrumentation on a rover that tells us about the uh, presence of water, the extent to which water might have interacted with the rocks, and then of course with that interaction you get the nutrients for life, and then you have the question of energy sources. So you pretty much have to do a geochemical type of analysis uh, to see if you have uh, preserved evidence for what might have been a habitable environment. And even if there is life on Mars today, if there's some feature at the surface that could have, have preserved evidence of it, you still have to do this kind of a mineralogical compositional study. Uh, to see if you're really in an area that, that has the capacity to preserve something that would have represented life. So uh, basically a, a geological uh, prospecting package of capability of camera, obviously, you've got to have mobility and camera and, and, uh, and then the ability to, um, you know, actually uh, do a, an elemental abundance measurement, the kinds of things, and, and of course mineralogy, and that mineralogy could be done a number of different ways. Spectroscopy, of course we'd love to do mineralogy with the X-ray diffraction capabilities of the Kemen instrument that's flying on Curiosity right now, so I would love to have that capability to determine what kinds of minerals, or particularly clay minerals, uh, might be there because some are better at preserving evidence of life than others. 
Um, you'd like to have some kind of a capability to look at the volatile and organic fraction. Uh, the, one of the best instruments for that is a mass spectrometer. I'd love to have that pretty much embodied with what we're seeing with SAM in the Curiosity mission. Uh, we're really coming to believe that the package that was, um, is on Curiosity is really ideal in many respects. What I'd like to add there in terms of surf sample preparation, though, would be to be able to grind into a surface of a rock so that we could uh, do a, a better interrogation of fresh material. We don't quite really have that capability with Curiosity, but I'd love to see that in there. Um, and what we're really looking for are not the evidence, definitive evidence of life, but what we would call potential biosignatures. And that any organic matter is a potential biosignature in my book, even if it's meteoritic, because that means you found a place that not only was habitable, but was able to preserve evidence of organic matter if it had been contributed there. And, uh, and so we're looking for these potential biosignatures. And this could include morphologic features. It could include certain types of minerals, uh, such as magnetite and so forth. Some of the times are known to be produced by microbes. But really for us, uh, the ability to detect the presence of organic matter uh, would really be high on my list for capabilities of, the, uh, of a rover. And so really much of what I would put on that list is what Curiosity has, plus that rock cleaning tool. Okay, I'll leave that for the moment. We can always come back if, if you want more of a detail in the answer. Okay, Julia de Marines, de Marines um, describe some of your most memorable moments with your involvement with the Mars program. Well, <clears throat> anytime you're talking about uh, Mars missions and especially landers, the memorable moments are the landings. <laughs> um, as you probably all know, the single most dangerous part of the mission that a rover has to experience is that entry, descent, and landing at Mars. The U.S. has now developed quite a, an amazing track record in this regard, and so we really seem to have uh, sort of caught the magic potion here that, uh, that really addresses that um, very dangerous part of the mission. But, you know, we have to just realize that every time we send a new uh, rover. So just the, uh, just with everybody else, I mean, we, we, it was a global experience this last time when Curiosity landed so safely and landed so perfectly in many respects. So for me, that's a highlight. The other highlight is like, for example, on the Spirit mission, uh, Mars Exploration Rovers, when we, we landed and we saw nothing but evidence of lava flows all around us and meteorite impacts and just dry, dusty, windy deposits. And I uh, just wondered, oh my gosh, is this the mission? You know, we'll, obviously we'll analyze these lava rocks, you know, the basalts, but, uh, you know, we really landed here because we thought Gustav Crater was a lake bed, you know. Uh, and so for us, I think it was just thrilling to take this roll of the dice to drive over two kilometers, two and a half kilometers away from our landing spot. And you might remember that we only promised the world these rovers would drive 600 meters. So we said, well, let's roll the dice and let's go to these hills that we see over there. And so for me, it was in incredibly exciting that they turned out to have been very altered by water. For all we know, they really do represent some aspect of the lake bed that was there. And so this was just tremendously rewarding. And then another follow-up with that mission was very exciting, was when we went down to this place called Home Plate and found first uh, sort of acid sulfate deposits and then also uh, the pure silica that really told us that not only was there volcanism here in water, but hydrothermal activity, that this for all intents and purposes could have been a habitable environment. And by golly, we just went and found that all on our own. We went to the right place. We made the right measurements even with a mission that you know has understandably a more restricted set of capabilities than uh, Curiosity does, still we were able with that mission to make a very satisfying determination that we were in a hot spring environment. And so for me, you know, it's just anything that's the end of a long effort and uncertainty and danger and all of that that turns out well, it's got to be right at the top of, of rewarding. And of course, after Spirit sort of passed into the, uh, into the history books, uh, for me the other rewarding thing was that opportunity was able to get all the way down to Endeavor Crater. I mean, Spirit sort of warned us, you know, these wheel actuators, they're not going to last forever, and yet here's opportunity chugging along. And for those of you who don't know, it'll be very exciting this summer when it looks like it's going to pass the Lunacod driving record and have the record for the longest traverse on another planet by uh, human technology. And so that'll be exciting as well. Um, just the fact these rovers have lift, lasted so long, I think, is a major, uh, major excitement. Okay, let's see here. Uh, how did our, our understanding of surface mineralogy petrology improve or change after the findings of MRO? 
Well, uh, boy, a lot of things came out of the MRO. Um, you know, we, we, uh, the, the um, Mars Express mission, the Omega instrument, really made the initial and very important, exciting discoveries of phyllosilicates or clay minerals on Mars, <clears throat> clearly demonstrating that, yes, water wasn't just running across the surface episodically, but it was hanging around long enough to really alter the rocks in ways that we're familiar with on the Earth. Um, what was amazing about MRO, of course, you know, there's a lot of instruments, and I'm sure I'm doing some of them injustice by focusing on just the CRISM instrument, which did the mineralogy, and of course the high-rise uh, camera, which uh, really gave us those beautiful high-resolution images, in, including color of, of the surface. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, in the end, you have to relate composition to features that you can see on the ground, you know, that you would see if you were just walking around. And those two instruments in combination have really done that. Uh, you know, CRISM, or uh, the Mars Express Omega instrument, discovered the phyllosilicates, but CRISM d mapped them at a resolution that was really able to allow us to reconcile what we saw there with what we see with the high-rise instrument, and to really get to the point here. To, to do this at a scale that is your, the scale of exploration of a rover on the surface. And so with those two instruments, um, you know, orbital instruments working in concert now with these rovers, we are really, you know, doing a rover mission. We are doing surface exploration from all these different perspectives that are just working wonderfully together. And so just for example now, we're on the verge of driving now, finally, or driving Curiosity to the mountain, Mount Sharp. And uh, my gosh, we have a view of the road ahead like we never could have dreamed. I mean, we've got, you know, better than, uh, you know, half meter resolution or 30 centimeter resolution on the surface with high rise. We have compositional information of that hill from, from CRISM. You know, and it just harkened back to the story I just mentioned about Spirit when we looked at those hills over there and thought, oh, geez, what's to lose? Let's go over there. I mean, if we, we know what we know now about those hills, if we'd known that at the time, we would have gone straight for certain places and, and really been able to discover a lot more. So MRO has just added this dimension. And of course, in terms of site selection, where do we go next? I told you about how huge the surface area of Mars is. Uh, the idea of selecting future sites now is just at a whole new plane of existence because of uh, the imagery of, of high rise coupled with the mineralogy capabilities of the assets that we have up there. It's just been transformational, and we now have this idea about a pervasive presence of water. Early on Mars, these phyllosilicates now with this improved resolution are global in distribution, especially at low latitudes, and uh, it just, it's just a whole new view of Mars. And of course, it's, it's just made it much more exciting. Now our problem is, which of these great places do we go to in the future? Um, and at some point, scientists are going to be divided in their opinions for good reasons, and the engineers will just pick the safest place. So. In a way, for scientists to have a control on the future landing site selection process, they're going to have to think through about how they're going to prioritize amongst a bunch of very promising places, as revealed by HiRISE and MRO. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, let me switch to another person here, uh, Svet Scholdier. Piggybacking on the previous instrument site question, uh, what's your vision for a Mars sample return in terms of lifetime and instrument suite? And is this the way you think NASA is taking that plan? Well, I have to be careful here because <laughs> I happen to be on the science definition team for Mars 2020. Okay, um, but I think it is safe for me to say that now that we've done a few rovers, uh, you know, the two MER rovers and the um, Curiosity rover, that we've identified a certain suite of measurement categories that are very robust. I mean, we clearly want to have a camera, okay? Uh, we clearly want to have some way of doing a, a chemistry, as we call it, or elemental abundance measurements. Uh, we need to interact with the surface of a, uh, of, a, of a sample, a rock, or whatever, in some ways to give us a, a better exposure, since everything seems to be covered with dust. And we need to approach mineralogy. Uh, and I guess the other thing I'll say that's uh, not going too far is that you need to be able to address these things, both as you're looking out in the field there, you know, tens to hundreds of meters out, not only with respect to what you see with your eyes, but what you, know, you might be able to infer about mineralogy. And then, of course, you want to be able to also have those kinds of capabilities when you get up and close and personal with a sample. And so just the, the basic, you know, visual observation, compositional information, information that you would need at the sample scale to make selections for samples, you know, you just need that type of capability. So maybe a key answer to your question 
is that a sa Mars sample return mission has to be a mission much like the Mars rovers were in its own right. It's got to be a mission that's exciting as it's going along, uh, you know, picking out the samples, but also just making those contextual observations. And um, and then the, then the, then it's you know it should be should be collecting these samples. And um, the key thing is that you know we've got we're going to put these samples in a little container. We're going to abide by all kinds of rules in doing that, and not just planetary protection and all that, but also for the science integrity of the samples. And I, you know, we have to be prepared for the possibility that you know it might be a few years before these samples get picked up. And you know the principal reason for that's political, frankly. I mean, it's uh, when are we going to have the budgets, and how are we going to be fair to the other parts of the solar system with respect to when we go, maybe go to Europa or Titan or you know some outer solar system destination. So there's a lot of uncertainty about the timing of the return of those samples. So we have to be very careful about uh, how we package and then store those so that they have good integrity uh, when we finally get around to bringing them back. So uh, these are all examples of things uh, that we have to worry about, you know, the sizes of the samples. The Mars Exploration Program Analysis Group, MEPAG, I was chair of that for about two and a half years. Uh, if you go on that website, just type in MEPAG and it'll pop up. Uh, as one of your selections in Google. Um, there's a lot of documents in there that address this whole issue of how what's the best way to do the samples and, and so forth. The, and these this is public information. This was the source of information that our science definition team can you know very much took to heart in our in our deliberations. And um, you know that that's probably a very detailed answer to your question. Uh, let me circle back up to Kara here. What kind of clay minerals are best to preserving signs of past life on Mars? Okay, uh, good question. Basically, the reason that you wash your clothes is that you're, you're putting a detergent in there to separate clay minerals from uh, organics, which happen to be your clothing. And so there's this intimate love affair between uh, clay minerals and organics. And it's been found that principally the very high surface area of clay minerals are very fine grain, typically a lot of surface area for their volume. Uh, all that surface area, having there's an affinity uh, with organic matter to that, so that the finer grain minerals, ones of course that are forming in water where the organic matter is present, are ones uh, the types of minerals that are going to be, um, you know, the ones that we want to look for. So first off, we want to find clay minerals that, uh, you know, as much as could we can determine, were formed in water, you know, or were it, it had a lot of exposure in water prior to their deposition. Uh, and that uh, then these were preserved in a way that, uh, you know, that the organic matter, if it was associated with them, would be preserved. And so, of course, as many of you know, the biggest problem we face there is oxidation on Mars. You look at Mars, it's oxidized at the surface, that nice ruddy red-orange color. And so we were very excited uh, in the Curiosity mission when we got over there to Yellowknife Bay and we drilled in into a surface that was red at the, t at the top. And suddenly we get into gray, blue-gray kind of uh, material coming up as the drill is going into the rock. And of course the material that went into the um, spacecraft for the analysis by Kemen and Sam also, also had that wonderful gray color which said, hey, you know, this stuff, my gosh, we were able just to go a few centimeters into the subsurface of this uh, pavement and get material that has not been oxidized. And so it's not just the clay mineral, but the clay mineral whose iron or whose associated minerals uh, giving you an indication that this this has not been oxidized, and so by implication, uh, that deposit has been fairly impermeable. I mean, as I just said, we're only two centimeters from the surface, and yet you don't get the oxidation that you're seeing on the surface. And so, uh, the type of clay mineral, the type of clay deposit that um, is is impermeable, uh, obviously plays very well into the preservation aspect of our of our concerns. So you you want an environment where that was habitable. Uh, you know, and that you could make the case uh, there could have been life there, but then also an environment that allowed a sediment to be deposited and preserved that, 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 that retained that record. And, and so those are the types of clay minerals that we're looking for. And I keep mentioning clay, clay, clay. It's really, it's 70 percent of where the organic matter is preserved in the crust of the earth. So that it's really, uh, that's why we're so excited about finding these clay deposits. But sulfate deposits and carbonate deposits, and of course um, silica deposits, are also very good at, at preserving um, organic matter. 
but volumetrically, they're not as significant on the Earth as on Mars, but we do have sulfate deposits on Mars. I think our biggest concern is to be able to demonstrate somehow that that deposit was not oxidized. There wasn't an oxidation problem that happened after it was deposited, if indeed it had organics in it. So this is kind of the thinking we always go through, you know, the minerals that tell you it was habitable, but also the minerals or the state of the samples that tell you that, that they've been good repositories for preserving things. And there, then you're set up, I think, to have the most effective search for uh, biosignatures. Okay, uh, Shauna Kendall, in your opinion, what are the big questions that need addressed in astrobiology, terrestrial and or beyond? Well, let me start with the biggest question, and that is, of course, the origins of life. Um, you know, I, I've often said, and I still believe, that probably the single most challenging question in science is to understand that how life can begin. And, uh, and I should partition that into two, uh, two, two aspects here. One is, how could life begin in the universe? And then the particular case of how did life begin on the Earth? Okay. And curiously, the question of how could life begin anywhere in the universe is an easier question. Because that is a question that's it's more deterministic in the sense of the kinds of chemistry and physics involved and the types of environments that planets or whatever could provide. You know, in, in principle, if those things are all in alignment in a certain environment, uh, life could begin. And that's sort of a deterministic view, I realize. But it's, it, but it's something you could go and conceivably emulate, simulate somehow. You know, either, you know in uh, what do you call silicon in silico or in, in vivo or in vitro in the lab or whatever. The harder question is how did life begin on the earth because you know that that depends on what the particular circumstances were it depends on and if it depends on environmental things that we don't that are not haven't been preserved okay and so you know the point is is that the earth is so geologically active and life has been so uh, dynamic in it in, in, and evolved that uh, the, the traces of its particular origins might be forever not, not obtainable to us. Uh, so just understanding in general how life could begin is an easier question. Anyway, I think that's the, really the top question. And for me, uh, it's easy to understand how life can persist if you know that you've got a source of energy and you're using that to maintain the kind of molecular and functional order that's needed to replicate and do all the things that keep cells going. You know, you can calculate thermodynamically, yeah, that makes sense, it could happen. But then the question is, how does, how does it start? How do you take the energy source and couple it to basically what amounts to an increase in information content of a molecule, of a structure, and of course, as you know, that's going against the second law of thermodynamics. So how do you, how do you push entropy back a bit to take energy in and begin to build up the kinds of information that meets the threshold of what would be self, something that could self-replicate or persist? And that, um, and so I think, given all the wonderful research that's been done on RNA and molecules and some of the simplest molecules it could be, and that's wonderful stuff. But they need to address how do you input the energy in the environment to that process to get it to get it propagating. To me, that's a tough problem, and, and it's it's right at the top. Um, the other key thing uh, really relates to Mars exploration. Another big question, and that is. You know, what really were these early environments? And the, the beauty of Mars, as you probably know, is that it's got this early record that's been preserved. I already just alluded to how that early record of environment, earliest record of environment on the Earth has been destroyed, but on Mars it's been preserved. Uh, you know, what's just the most effective way to get at that? And, and what are the key aspects that we should be measuring that really relate to this question of the environment suitable for the origins of life? And I, I make another important point here about habitable environments. There's two flavors of these potentially in principle. There's the habitable environment where if you sent something there today that was alive, it could, it could survive. Then there's the planetary environment where, that could support the origins of life. And it's not clear to me that these are synonymous. Okay, For example, it's not clear to me, we could argue this, that the environments that you see on the earth today are the best for the origins of life. Maybe not, maybe so. So there's two flavors of habitable environments that we have to keep in mind. So how do we sort this out, and particularly how do we go to another planet like Mars or Europa or Titan and really establish the information we needed to know about what that early environment was and, and how it relates to this origins question. So those are some really important things. And then, of course, the same thing applies to the early Earth. Um, we know we have, we have evidence of life certainly back to 3.7 billion years ago. Some people would argue older. 
Uh, but these rocks have really been tortured. And um, there's just so much more we'd like to learn about the nature of life at that time. But that requires the kind of detailed information that you find in organic molecules. And is that if we've really done the, all we can do in looking for those early um, evidences of life in the Archean record, uh, rocks that are older than about 2.8 seem to be particularly fry, well fried. And, um, but yet it's not clear that everything has been just totally destroyed beyond recognition. So how can we get at that more effectively? By you know deep drilling projects, places just really go for where we think the best rocks are going to be, uh, using the latest technology at the micro scale, inclus inclusions in rocks and all of that. And then of course uh, the other major approach, which is um, you know the molecular approach of, of re reconstructing early uh, life capabilities from resurrection of, of, of genome of genomes and, and, and enzyme capabilities. I think another area where astrobiologists could play a great role is what's the, what's the what's the family tree of key enzymes in life, not just the DNA, uh, you know, the the big tree of life based on 16 or S ribosomal RNA, but also the tree of of various protein life. And as we know, that can sometimes punch further back even than than some of the uh, RNA DNA records potentially. And how does that help us understand just you know gene transfers and just the whole fabric with which evolution unfolded over billions of years? And so certainly astrobiologists having that desire to understand origins, I think, are going to bring an important flavor to the, to the, to the uh, research labs of, of, of uh, molecular biologists to really focus on our origins as preserved in the molecular record. And then, of course, extrasolar planets. Um, I think, <clears throat> just like astrobiology, I think, has played a key role in getting the Mars program restarted in the 90s and also, you know, a lot of what I've talked about earlier, I think it's going to, it should, and we really need to take up the flag to take a leading role to try to get the, uh, you know, the uh, terrestrial planet finder type mission uh, on the books. Uh, again, that's a budgetary issue. It's not an inexpensive mission. But fortunately, Kepler lived long enough to show that there's just a lot of planets out there. We can really think about designing telescopes to analyze atmospheres, focusing more on the capability to uh, analyze the nature of the atmosphere uh, rather than just also trying to find planets. Uh, there's planets now seem to be so widely distributed and particularly around G-type stars like our own that um, you know I think we really now can, can develop a, a major argument for moving forward on a terrestrial planet finder type mission. So what are the steps needed to get to that and that's a challenge for the astrobiology community to pitch in on. Okay well those are some big questions I think need to be addressed. Uh, let me see, let's move on to the next one. What do you feel has been your biggest contribution to the field of astrobiology and what do you think has been the most surprising or impacting discovery in the field of astrobiology in the last 10 years? Uh, well, I guess my biggest contribution to the field of astrobiology might have been earlier work I did on the carbon cycle. I mentioned uh, calculating the flux of carbon from the mid-ocean ridges and trying to understand carbon on the earth not just in the context of organic matter that life makes and preserves and rocks and the atmosphere and the oceans but also the whole cycle of carbon that reaches down deep into the earth and and of course as you know a very important part of the story is how things have changed over billions of years and there is much hotter in earth interior in the early days the mantle of the earth was probably much more engaged with the surface environment back then than it is today, although it's obviously still very important today. But the point is, this really shaped the nature of that early environment. And so I think you know, the work I did years ago on looking at carbon in early rocks, trying to calculate fluxes and so forth, um, provided a little bit more perspective and background for just really understanding what type of an environment the early Earth had. I think another uh, contribution I've made was to sort of help to coordinate over the last some 25 years uh, the Microbial Ecology Research Program in Baja, California, where we brought in uh, biogeochemists, people doing molecular biology, people um, interested in more geologic aspects uh, to, and organic geochemistry to uh, really get a holistic view of what a cyanobacterial microbial mat is all about. And uh, so we've had a series of papers and I wrote some review papers over the years of our understanding of that, and I think it came to be recognized at a point as probably one of the best characterized uh, microbial ecosystems that were particularly relevant to our early biosphere. And I, I should add now, of course, that there's been a number of other environments now where people have done comparable amounts of work, but this idea of really getting a bunch of interdisciplinary uh, efforts going at a, at a focused place like that 
I certainly was involved in that early in the early going, and I, I, I'm pretty happy about uh, you know what's what's ensued from that. And then, of course, I should mention my role in the astrobiology roadmap. Uh, I chaired the major revision in 2003, as well as the update in 2008. And I think in terms of just trying to help to determine a focus for the program, a few things that are key, I sort of alluded to them as I answered a, an earlier question, uh, I think has, has been helpful to keep, to keep the ship sort of heading in a direction which the community really determined was the most important way to go. So. It, these were not my ideas. Uh, my job was just to make sure that the community ideas were focused in a, in a document in a way that would be useful for the uh, for NASA headquarters to uh, to move out on. So those are some of the high points. Uh, there's more details, but um, I think in the interest of moving to the next question, I will do that. The most su surprising or impacting discovery in the field of astrobiology. Well, just that was your second question. I mean, everything I mentioned about Mars. You know that there's so much more evident, widespread evidence for water activity in, on the planet early in its going. I mean, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention for exoplanets the major discoveries by Kepler. I mean, we, you know, that's that's huge. I don't think even the Kepler people expected that they would have such a high uh, discovery rate. That's a huge impact for astrobiology because it's all about habitable environments. So the Mars thing and the exoplanet discoveries by Kepler all address this very important habitable environment uh, aspect of astrobiology. Um, in terms of molecular, well, you know, in terms of other aspects, I mean, you know, I think every major f if aspect of astrobiology, there's been something that's really important that's happened in the last 10 years. Uh, the increase in the program that happened in the 90s has just led to a lot of this stuff. Uh, you know, things, ideas about the roles of RNA, uh, interesting uh, aspects about molecular evolution, and um, you know, gene transfer. A lot of that research was supported uh, through the uh, astrobiology program, and uh, you know, you can just add that to the list. I'm danger in real serious danger here of leaving out something, but uh, yeah, I just say that there's more examples that could be cited. Aditya, I understand that every time we send spacecraft to Mars, there are always some bacteria spores that hitch a ride despite the cleanup process. Could you please describe if these are expected to survive space transit, EDL, and the environment of Mars, even if it, if it even, if it is just for a short time? Okay, uh, okay. There, there's a serious effort to uh, un decrease the bioloading on these spacecraft, uh, be, but because the ones that we've sent recently are not life detection, uh, it's the these uh, loading reduction has not had to be as severe as it was for the Viking mission. So absolutely right. Uh, the, the bacterial loads are very low, but they some of them do escape the cleanup process. Uh, just one example I could give is that the circuitry, the uh, solid state circuitry that is used, you know, you just can't heat that like we were heating the rather primitive stuff that was passed for electronics back in Viking. And so we're inevitably going to have some some organisms in there. So they probably they definitely survive space transit. They survive EDL. Uh, and they're probably lurking out in the rover for a period of time. But there's an important consideration here, and that is that the surface environment is hostile, okay? And so if an organism were to get away from that spacecraft, uh, it would probably not survive for very long. And this is the key thing. This is what's called the loading rate for Mars, the uh, ability of Mars to accept microbes coming from the Earth, but yet destroy them at a rate that's greater than the rate at which they can propagate. And so the way we've done these spacecraft, they definitely fall within the safe envelope there. Uh, sure, there's bacteria on there, maybe a few, you know, I'm not going to guess at a number. There's obviously, there's a lot, easy to get a lot of them. But, um, you know, they're in that spacecraft. If they're on the outside surface, they're getting toasted. They're probably gone already, certainly on the two Mars rovers, or Mer and uh, Spirit and Opportunity. Uh, there are probably some lurking inside, but if they stick their little heads out, uh, they're toast. Uh, so that's sort of the situation. Um, you know, none of this is proven, of course. You know, you don't assemble a rover ready for launch and then tear it down again to do bioassays. But, you know, there's ways at, at, at JPL and at, at Kennedy where they can do assays and get what they call a statistically representative sampling of what's in those rovers. But anyway, that's the overall picture. Uh, yeah, EDL means entry, descent, landing. Eric Tucker, do you, what do you believe NASA's role is in education and public outreach? Gee, that's a topical question. Um, <clears throat> well, I think the principal role of NASA in education and outreach 
is uh, obviously to give the public uh, a return for their investment and to do things that really uh, sort of advance the, uh, you know, this, this, the, um, the uh, interests of the country, the, uh, the long-term well-being of the country, and of course that would be maybe principally in the area of technology development, uh, but also in terms of an inspiration. I think, um, you know, science and technology are central to the economy of any country. Uh, any country that is sort of ignores that is at their peril, and NASA has not <laughs> only been excellent at, at cause, uh, having technology development happen directly as a result of its actions, but it's, I think, excellent at inspiring young people uh, to consider, if not NASA as a career, uh, some kind of a science or technology career. Um, and, and the other the, the thing that follows from that is that I think it's appropriate for NASA to have the role of uh, you know, disseminating the information that we get from our research and from our missions to this first step of, of dissemination to where a, an education type organization, such as perhaps, you know, Department of Education or, or the public school system or whatever, state school systems, you know, could then take it from there. Uh, so I think really uh, there needs to be a capability that's very close to the missions themselves that um, disseminates that information or very close to the research programs such as the Astrobiology Institute uh, to do that. I think that is a role that's totally within NASA and I think uh, and uh, that there's been a lot of consensus not just within NASA but, but elsewhere for that. So I think for me that's the most defensible role. When you get out into the business of being in classrooms and so forth, well, all, many of us enjoy that having direct contact with students. Um, I guess there could be more of a discussion as how that type of activity would be partitioned between NASA and, and other uh, agencies of government, both state and federal. So that's a first order answer. I think, you know, the first step towards education outreach, you know, information moving out to the, to the audience is a NASA role that's associated with the sources of the information, be they missions or some of the basic research programs. Okay, here's Kara's question. One last question for me. Any advice on how to survive grad school in planetary sciences? How to survive grad school in planetary sciences? Okay, well, the first thing that comes to mind is this comment I made earlier about um, maintaining sort of a core discipline, um, you know, be it in chemistry or in physics or biology or something like that. Uh, and, and, you know, as you know, planetary and sciences very much involves physics and very mathematics. Um, and of course, uh, you know, various aspects of Earth sciences. For example, you know, the questions that we had earlier about remote sensing of Mars, uh, or the comments I made about, uh, you know, the CRISM instrument or the uh, Mars Express instrument, Omega, uh, or just for that matter, the remote sensing observations of um, high rise and the uh, camera on Mars Express. Uh, these are all aspects of geological sciences, environmental sciences that are that are used on the Earth. I mean, you know, we, we do a lot of a lot of remote sensing of the Earth, and so ge geologic uh, things are also very important for uh, planetary sciences. Uh, I think the way you survive grad school is just make sure that you you've, you've got your courses and your um, your, your learning curve uh, definitely on track with respect to one of these core disciplines as you're going through grad school. Um, surviving, well, you know, I mean, that's that's getting good grades. It's uh, you know, getting a good uh, research topics that you can defend in your qualifiers. It's just like surviving grad school and any of the other uh, topics that are more traditional. Um, you know, planetary, I, think, I guess the other thing I should say about planetary sciences is that there's a number of departments around the country, and I guess it's really true just in biology or physics or anything else. Um, these, these departments in planetary sciences, they have different emphases and specializations. And, uh, you know, and that sort of gets back to what's your interest. I mean, what, what is it that turns you on about doing science or technology? Uh, that sort of then starts with do you do physics, chemistry, math, or, or biology, or whatever. But then it also relates to then what aspect of planetary science do you find compelling? And, and uh, some schools are just really very deep well about that. The deep, they have a very deep well of, 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 um, of opportunities for that. And so I think. I guess what I'm going to finish with is the comment that you'll survive the best in grad school and planetary scientists if you if you're true to yourself and your interests. Uh, if you're really interested in something, uh, you know you, you're going to do well. And uh, so and then but that in, that makes means making sure that you're in the right discipline like chemistry, physics, biology, or whatever, and that you're also at the in the in this planetary science school 
that really uh, resonates most completely with what aspect of planetary science you find most compelling for yourself. To Shana Kendall, to expand on your background, it has become quite diverse. Did you just keep an eye out for opportunities as they came up? Okay, well, thank you for that. Uh, actually, um, <laughs> there's two kinds of careers. This is sort of a joke, but maybe not. Uh, and you can either have the animal or plant type career. Um, the animal career, you're a specialist, right? You're really good at something, and to keep your resources and your lifestyle, you move around, okay? Or the plant is something that sort of sits in one place, but it has to be quite versatile in its chemistry and uh, some of the things that it has to cope with by being stuck in one place if environments can change. And so I've been here in, since 1976, and so you might say I'm more of the plant. <laughs> and that is, over the years, um, I've, I've seen opportunities come along, and I've uh, gotten excited about them. You can, again, you got to be excited about it. And I've just sort of chosen to change my research emphasis over the years in response to changes in opportunities, but also uh, things popping up that I said, you know, I, I could get interested in that. And so I sort of took on the, the plant type uh, mode of life. Um, that might be a luxury these days. I don't know. I mean, I think a lot of young people who are very skilled uh, realize that they maybe have to change jobs every few years to keep their score, core skill set, but, but tailor the tailor their strategy to the changing conditions, changing environments, as it were. Uh, so I think there's sort of a biological analog here that's useful. Um, you know, I just happen to be fascinated by the way systems integrate with each other. So I was interested in this carbon cycle thing long before, you know, the interdisciplinary astrobiology thing became a, a fashion. Well, more than that, it became a very compelling program. And so I guess just my interest in how systems work in concert uh, set the table for me to be interested in how uh, systems would work and more in the context of astrobiology. So I guess for me, um, the fact that I've been involved in a number of things and uh, over, the, over these years was sort of due to my receptiveness to being interested in how systems work together and then also just being lucky, you know, to be working for NASA. I have to say it's, it's just rich, been rich with opportunities uh, and to have those, my interests and the opportunities here uh, match nicely. Question from Hessian, if money and resources were not an issue, what would you like to see the next mission to Mars to include or accomplish? Well, I would like to see um, uh, the next, I, you know, the ideal would be to have a, a Curiosity type mission uh, with a, maybe a little bit of a rock grinding capability there uh, that would have, really would have the ability to, uh, to get samples cached and to, and to bring them back. Um, I'm sure many of you heard all the arguments why sample return is, is such a compelling thing. And I guess, um, you know, if some people say, well, we've already got Mars meteorites, why do we have to go get samples ourselves? Well, you know, Mother Nature chose which, meteor, which samples to give us in terms of the Mars meteorites, but we get to choose which samples to bring back, uh, you know, if we actually go there with the mission. Uh, so I would sure like to see a Curiosity capability put together with a sample return. Uh, that would be just wonderful. And of course, as you know, and it really, I think, a better, beautiful example of this was the Allen Hills meteorite uh, debate and analyses that were done, is that you get a sample back and suddenly it tells you that there's things you could look at that you didn't even think of. Uh, and there's laboratories that uh, you should get involved that never have been involved before with uh, analyzing samples from other planets. And, 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 and so just having those samples back, and in this case from a compelling place, uh, to me, suddenly really puts us in the game of life detection on Mars. And with what we've now learned about where to go, and I think uh, as this mission unfolds at Gale Crater, uh, people will just get more and more amazed by uh, just what a wonderful site it was for landing. Uh, to me, that's just, it would be just tremendous. Uh, to have an intelligent site selection of samples, you put it together and, might, and get them back. I'd love to see them coming back in the 2020s and just get on with that whole new level of um, investigation and, I think, understanding about Mars. And I should add that a sample coming back would include an atmospheric sample as well and a sample of the regolith. Uh, you know, every time we've, we've had samples come back before, it's just told us things we never even knew to ask questions about. And I just think that's going to be a transformational for, for Mars science. Uh, let's see, so that question was Mars. Okay, so we'll leave it at that. 
Okay, regarding manned missions, what do you think about the private sector's plans to send people to Mars, SpaceX.com? And should they work with NASA to plan their protection reasons? Um, well, I think it's wonderful. I mean, I think uh, SpaceX in particular has shown that they can very economically uh, get up to the space station and do things that, uh, you know, frankly, people didn't suspect were going to be possible so soon. And there's every reason to suspect that their approach could be a, one of, of a very uh, effective approaches for doing Mars. My personal philosophy about sending humans to Mars is that the first mission would be an orbital mission with the humans and that they could do a lot of interesting things with robotics, not just on Mars, but with maybe Phobos or so forth uh, in orbiting the uh, Mars. Um, be a lot less risk, it'd be a lot easier to envision them actually being able to come back and it would retire a lot of risks associated with an ultimate mission to the surface. Now some people are much more enthusiastic about going to the surface on that first mission and um, you know, I, I, I sort of depart from that because I'm used to, you know, doing missions in a series. And, of course, the, the classic example of that was the Apollo missions, uh, where we actually really got there, but it, you know, we did it in a series of deliberate steps. So, you know, I think what the private industry is doing is, is wonderful. Uh, I think there's a difference of opinion about whether that first mission would be to the surface with humans or in orbit, because we have the whole planetary protection uh, issue also with Mars. But, uh, you know, I, I think it's a great thing, and well, that's, it's, it's our future. I mean, you know, the private is industry, sec private sector is going to be the future for, for all of this. It's just a question of when and how. Uh, what are the advantages, disadvantages of looking for biosignatures in the visible versus infrared while characterizing exoplanets? Uh, well, let's see. Um, infrared, let's see. Infrared is better for, uh, oh geez, okay. that's been like, what, 12 years since I really got involved in this. Uh, there's a lot of water lines in the visible that help with detecting water. Um, the infrared uh, giving you, gives you a bunch of molecular information that, uh, well, it's really good because of the ozone, the O3. It's, it's very strongly detectable in the infrared, so you probably have better sensitivity for oxygen. But you can see oxygen in the visible, but it's, it's more challenging. So that's right, I'm, it's coming back to me now. I, Infrared is better for O2, if you, and it is really, really maybe the ultimate biosignature that you could hope to detect remotely. Um, there again, as I said earlier, the, this question was the source of the comment that it would be lovely to do both. They're very complementary with an E uh, to each other. Uh, as I just said, the visible is really good for water. The infrared is better for O2. Uh, CO2 also better in the infrared. Uh, in terms of signal to noise, the visible is, is making rapid progress because of uh, just the incredible improvements in, in the technology. Uh, and it has less troubles with the, um, the, uh, the discs, the dust problem, the, um, the zodiac, zodiacal dust problem. And that's, and so there, you know, it's, it's sort of TBD, uh, you know, anyway, that's some comments. On a lighter note, what was it like to throw, how did somebody find, throw out the opening pitch at the San Francisco Giants ball game? Uh, <laughs> That was uh, that was quite an experience. Uh, you're you're a you're a you're a rock star right up to the moment you throw the pitch. Uh, so that was sort of cool, you know, people interviewing you and and all that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> I got some really great advice before doing it, and that is don't stand on the mound and on the rubber and try to throw it like a like a professional pitcher, uh, because one of the things they said that the crowd will do if you, if you throw that ball and it hits the dirt before it gets to the catcher is that they will boo you. The entire stadium just loves the idea of booing people who throw the ball in the dirt. And he said, uh, this advice I got said that uh, the former pre first George Bush, pre uh, George H.W. Bush, uh, threw it in the dirt in San Diego when he was down there, and the whole crowd booed him. So even the President of the United States will be booed. And he said, you can say, you can laugh it off, he said, but it'll stick in your conscience that the whole audience booed you. So he said, stand in front of the mound, right in front of it, and then throw that pitch a nice firm arc. Don't try to throw a fastball. And if just if you can get it to him in the air, you will have succeeded. So I did that, and uh, you know uh, it was really really quite an amazing experience that way. There's a little story about it was supposed to, a robot was supposed to come out and deliver the pitch to me, the ball to me, and I had to wrestle it out of the claws of this robot, which sort of was going against the message about humans cooperating with robots, but. Um, you know, that worked out. And I still have that baseball. It's got some dig marks on the two sides where the robot wouldn't let go. But other than that, it was pretty cool. And they give you a free ticket. And uh, once once you've thrown the pitch, they say, okay, get the heck off the field and uh, go get, you know, get back up in the stands and it's over. 
Uh, but it's neat. And I have to say, for me, the most enjoyable part of this has been the fact that I, people keep asking me this question years later. Uh, it's, a, it's something I did that uh, probably has more recognition than any paper I ever wrote. So uh, thanks for the question. The uh, tradition continues. Okay. Um, and with that, I guess I'll, uh, I'll wrap up. Uh, yeah, and I think that's it pretty much for the questions. So uh, it's really been enjoyable. A great set of questions. I appreciate it. And as always, when you get these types of questions, it compels you to think a little more deeply about not only the what, but the why. And uh, that certainly was the case today. So thanks again.